particular method of thinking which is probably the most central foundational piece necessary when studying subjects of an occult nature, or as they have been called, the Ars Symbolis, the art of symbols. This method of thinking runs counter to the left-brained approach most prevalent in our contemporary Western civilization. Let's call this left-brain popularized approach the dissectional approach. The cognitive methodology inculcated by our educational system is Aristotelian in nature. That is, it attempts to understand things by systematically categorizing them. This is done by strict and exclusive reliance on what can be observed by the physical senses, physical qualities and quantities of things. This is called nominalism, meaning to give names to things. This is in contradistinction to Platonic realism, the belief that all physical manifestations are imperfect expressions in the material realm of forms or ideas which are changeless and therefore eternal or more perfect. In the Platonic realism school of thought, something can only come into being if there are underlying patterns which serve as a kind of blueprint or scaffolding by which physical matter can organize itself, analogous perhaps to a mental DNA. This exists in an archetypal realm composed solely of undifferentiated consciousness, free of the confines, flux, and decay of material form. By adult life, this ingrained process of Aristotelian systemization of subjective experience is fairly automatic and unconscious to a large degree. Many of us have been successfully overtrained in one type of thinking and are ignorant of our own ignorance regarding other modes of cognition. Our dominant mode of interaction with the exterior world is to categorize things by first noticing the specific characteristics which are particular to them, those attributes which set them apart from some things and in a category or class with others. While simple, this system of classification has extended itself to the nth degree in our modern reductionist scientific materialist worldview. This is a reductive method in that it separates the components of objective experience, dissecting them, as it were, into observable, measurable components of what we will agree to call reality. But we cannot come to a holistic picture of things by cutting things into ever smaller pieces. Now this method has served us in countless ways regarding the understanding of material reality. However, it was once regarded as a method of approaching the purely material universe as distinct from the methods of spiritual or symbolic experience, which is an inner and personal experience. What we are suffering from, in my estimation, in large part, is the distrust and outsourcing of our own subjective experience through a priori rationalization. Part of spiritual growth and development is learning to trust, vet, but trust your subjective experience and hold it on a par with things objectively verifiable without necessarily having to dismiss one or the other. To some, this is the definition of cognitive dissonance, but that's only because of the Aristotelian paradigm we've been mired in for so long. It's like a fish trying to describe water. The material realm is in fact a realm of complete contradiction. Things are literally defined and inextricably tied to their polar opposite. We glean an affirmation of this in the ancient Egyptian cosmology through the Hall of Maat or Truth. When literally translated, it means the Hall of Two Truths. When we embody the strictly this or that mindset of Aristotelian nominalism, we're stuck swinging from polarity to polarity the undulation of extremes. To find the mean between the two, the middle way is to find the truth. It is for this reason that in many Western esoteric initiatic traditions, the candidate is placed between two pillars. It should be noted that the splitting of the hemispheres into inherently oppositional natures is an oversimplification, yet it serves the purposes of this discussion as an analogy. So what I'm driving at here is that our left hemisphere mode of thinking automated, categorical, this or that systemization, the part of our brain that directs our consciousness towards dissecting our experience has usurped the abstract, artistic, mysterious, or innately intuitive faculties which our right hemisphere gives us, thereby weakening or obscuring the power that comes 
from a holistic synthesis of both types of cognitive experience and ways of existing in this world. We have become out of balance, not merely due to religious and or political alignments, but as individuals in ourselves. The intellectual Aristotelian nominalist paradigm dissects, perceives separateness. It contains analytical reasoning. It is detailed, methodical, materialistic. It is the abode of the ego or conscious mind. We could call it the suit or businessman archetype, or even the scientist archetype. It avers this or that, and uses language, typically sophisticated language, to communicate. The abstract, intuitive aspect of our psyches connects. It perceives a holistic oneness. It prefers abstract reasoning and big picture thinking. It's syncretic. It's feeling and intuitive. It's the abode of the unconscious. It embodies the mystic or artistic archetype. It avers this and that, and it uses available imagery, i.e. symbols, to communicate. We are tiny universes that are in constant subversion of their own inherent microcosmic laws. There are vast, undiscovered aspects of our own being that we will never be able to experience and integrate unless we come to see the truth about polarization. So, what part do symbols play in all this? The subconscious aspect of our minds uses symbols to communicate, such as in dreams, or the abstract inspiration via images that visual and other kinds of artists typically experience. It cannot use language because it is the quote-unquote first child of human development, both individually and collectively. It is pre-verbal. It is that part of ourselves that developed and was in existence before language. In fact, Letters as symbols, names as symbols for things, developed out of this and a need for expression in the material realm. So I'm not saying one is better than the other. Just at this point, we're at a state of massive imbalance. This is the key to the beginning of a new way of perceiving our lives in what we refer to commonly as reality. Because while strictly materialist scientific paradigms can explain the observable universe, even if it is an admittedly paltry less than 5% of it, it still cannot and never will be able to compute subjective experience in any cogent or meaningful way, nor can it give us any clues as to how to access these other types of experience. Taking the as above, so below theory, or the macrocosm and microcosm, we understand that what is stimulated to activity in any part of us is also stimulated in our spheres of sensation and in the exterior world. Therefore, to stimulate the subconscious of an individual is to bring whatever power, aspect, or pattern that symbol is meant to represent into action in the conscious mind, which is furthermore serving to bring that power, aspect, or pattern to activity in some way, in the localized exterior reality of the individual, of which we as individuals are indeed co-creators. We can here take Plato's doctrines of the theory of forms as the underlying philosophy behind how symbols are able to do this. The anamnesis, or remembering that of which our psyches or souls have come into contact with on another plane, the ideal realm or realm of forms, as well as the idea of the psychicosmu, or soul of the world, or anima mundi of Renaissance and medieval philosophers, that which responds to the individual soul, since the latter is a miniature pattern of and nested consciousness within the former. This is summed up eloquently and profoundly in the zero equals zero ritual of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, in the line, by names and images are all powers awakened and reawakened. The great secret is that the symbols are the teachings. Anything said of or about them are in reality guidelines or commentary to their use and comprehension so that we might not remain in a state of ignorance about them, being unwittedly affected as millions of us are daily by their very little suspected presence all around us, but rather that we should select those symbols that align to our own purposes of psycho-spiritual growth and development. Teachings regarding the symbols are also a method of retaining them and passing them on, a medium of transmission. 
The symbols will work their magic of their own accord and according to their specific natures, whether the commentary they have been transmitted with is accurate or not. This effect is one of the several key components that give ritual initiation and ritual in general such effective power. To summarize, a symbol is a physical form which can contain entire volumes of information were we to write it down. It's much more than a mere aesthetic. It stimulates the corresponding form of which it is an expression and its associated ideas in the subconscious of the observer and has an effect proportionate to its saturation or time and attention given to it by an individual. It is alchemical in nature, similar to a talisman. In fact, the aesthetic use of symbols can have significant consequences on the psyche of the individual appropriating them for good or ill. A symbol, particularly one embedded in the mind and sphere of the practitioner, will begin to draw things consonant to and harmonious with it into the life experience of the practitioner. This is why initiates of old insisted on never altering these symbols nor profaning them. The word profane now has an entirely different connotation than its original Latin etymological use, profanum, before or outside of the temple. When they admonished never to profane a symbol, it meant never to expose it to those uninitiated in its use and meaning. The profound effect of symbols to stimulate these things is the exact reason that systems such as the Golden Dawn have prolonged periods of studies and rote memorization of specific symbols such as the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the signs of the planets and zodiac, and their Kabbalistic correspondences, to name a few. The purpose is to saturate and imprint the sphere of the student, and thereby establish a reliable symbolic vocabulary. Once this vocabulary is established, it's as if you've learned a foreign language. You can now communicate more clearly and reliably with the inhabitants of that particular region. In astral and vision work, symbols are of the utmost importance so that we can reliably and safely navigate these planes, being at the disadvantage provided to us by the material senses. Entities on the other side of the veil, so to speak, are in reality disembodied forms of consciousness and energies. They can and do take form, but there's not a 100% guarantee that the form they show to the mind's eye of the practitioner has anything to do with their actual nature particularly if this nature is one of deception. It is by the use of symbols that we can arm ourselves or disarm a dishonest entity and assure that we travel in the realms which we have consciously selected for investigation and communion. In this way, we have a buffer against self-delusion. There's a great deal more to be said of this kind of magic and we'll cover it in detail in other episodes. The last thing I want to mention given all of this information is the importance of the mental diet. Just as the body either excels or suffers in large part due to diet, so does the mind and soul either receive clarity and light or obscurity and delusion by the ignorance of darkness. As practitioners, with an intention towards spiritual growth and balance, we must curate the images which we allow to saturate and imprint our spheres and subconscious minds. In this way, like attracts like. Willful ignorance of the dark, however, is not a middle path either. Blind adherence to the light because it feels good or has some kind of pallid effect on our past traumas is also an imbalance. But like physical balance, spiritual and mental balance must be felt, not theorized. There is no one prescription for balance for every individual. We all possess spiritual, let's say, postural differences. The first step towards this is becoming aware of what we had previously allowed ourselves to remain ignorant of and to begin paying attention to the images and even words, which are symbols, that surround us every day. If you've enjoyed this video, like and subscribe to my channel and remember to turn on all notifications. Please do consider contributing to the Arcanum Patreon for exclusive bonus videos, interviews and tutorials and to help me continue to produce more free content like this. Join me again in the next video where we'll be diving deeper into the historical, theoretical, and practical sides of this and many other related topics. Thanks for watching. In Loose.